Uh, Susan, Spencer, thank you so much for joining us today. Great pleasure. Thank you. So, uh, Spencer, I wonder if I could start with you. Uh, we are starting to hear that the housing market is recovering. Uh, based on the data you see at Zillow, uh, what do you see? And uh, how even is the recovery across different regions? Well, um, housing is back. So in 2012, home values were up 6% year over year. And in 2013, Zillow is forecasting 3% appreciation year over year, which is a little bit on the conservative side as compared with other economists. But we've had 16 months in a row of appreciating home values, which is great. Um, there is very tight inventory across the country. And one of the reasons for that is so many homeowners still have negative equity, and so it's difficult for them to sell. So there's not that much inventory, and that's because of low mortgage rates. That's creating bidding wars in a lot of areas. And so we're seeing some parts of the country appreciating at unsustainably high rates. Phoenix is over 15% year over year. South Florida is appreciating very quickly. Northern California is appreciating very quickly. And that's a little worrisome. I think those, those rates of appreciation are unsustainable. Um, but overall, this is a much, much better housing market than it really it has been in the last several years. What do you think, Susan? Well, I agree, and I think that the months of appreciation, 16 months and, and ongoing, uh, restores confidence. And the negatives in the market have been a lack of confidence and unwillingness to put your money into housing when it's been such a threatening position to have been. Most people know people who've lost $40,000 and but this is a different world, and this is a world where housing price rises are, in fact, sustainable. They will continue. I also concur in a 3 percent. In fact, I'm forecasting 5 percent price rises this coming year. That's interesting. Well, uh, let, let's go back, Spencer, to, to uh, you know, before Zillow was launched. Uh, you founded Hotwire, uh, which you sold to Expedia. And then you also worked for Expedia as vice president of lodging. Well, how did your background in technology and marketing uh, inform the, the, the way Zillow was shaped? Um, when we sold Hotwire to Expedia, uh, I, I joined and my management team from Hotwire joined the folks that had created Expedia within Microsoft about 10 years earlier. And the whole um, thesis behind creating Expedia was to provide information transparency to consumers. Prior to Expedia, as you probably recall, you'd have to speak on, on the phone to a travel agent and you could hear them type, type, type you know, over the phone and all you'd want to do is jump through the phone and see for yourself what secret database is that travel agent looking at that I don't have access to. And that's what Expedia did. It turned around the screen so that you as a consumer could have access to the secret database. When we were at Expedia, we started looking at other industries that hadn't been revolutionized by the internet yet. And it was obvious to us that the real estate industry was among them, that there were these secret databases that only professionals had access to. And there was all this great data locked up in these, these databases, but also in county courthouses. And so at Zillow, we aim to unlock that information and make it readily available to consumers. The difference, though, is in the real estate space, unlike the travel space, there will always be an intermediary, uh, somebody in the transaction. And that's, that's fine by us. We actually think that Real estate transactions are so infrequent, so expensive, so highly emotional, so complex that there will always and should always be a professional in the transaction. So we have a very different business model at Zillow. We sell advertising and software tools to professionals. Um, that's how we make money, rather than being in the transaction, which is how Expedia makes money, by being an online travel agent. Uh, Susan, what do you think of the business model that uh, Spencer just described? Zillow is a game changer. I can't talk about the uh, profitability of the, of the company, but the what it has brought to the consumer, to the homeowner, in terms of valuation of their home is extremely important, especially in these years of extraordinary volatility, when people want to know what is their home worth? Has it, in fact, fallen by 50 percent? Which homes in many parts of the country have? Uh, do you have to actually go to someone, to an expert, get several different views? No, this is getting the power of all the data, bringing it together in very sophisticated analytic models, and it's there for you to test. And by the way, if it appears to be off in some ways, there is now a way of going back. So this is, this is really extraordinarily important. Um, you need to know the value of your home today for many reasons. Are you going to sell as compared to your mortgage amount? Uh, this democratizes data and it makes the market more transparent and more efficient, all of which is very important to this market, which has seen its troubles. This helps bring liquidity back. That, that's very interesting, Susan, you said that, because uh, one of the things that I found most interesting on Zillow was the, was the zest Zestimate. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I promptly, of course, went and looked up the value of my own house. Uh, now, what I was very curious is, how do you figure out what the house is worth? How does your algorithm work? 
Well, the, the short answer is the, the data base, look, the, the, the software looks at the property attributes of your home and compares it with like homes. Um, the much longer answer is at each census tract level, census tract is basically a couple neighborhood blocks, we have um, a meta model that sits on top of many other submodels. And so, for example, a submodel might look at tax assessment. Another might look solely at uh, distance to an arterial. Another might look at dollars per square foot. Uh, another might look at um, just regressions against number of bedrooms, for example. Um, and the meta model at the census tract level tries different weightings of each of the submodels going back 15 years and is constantly improving itself by changing the allocations, the relative weighting of the different submodels to figure out what's the right weighting across each submodel to be as accurate as possible. So as time passes, as more and more data comes into the system, it becomes more accurate over time. And point of fact, about a third of homes in the US now have had their property attributes changed on Zillow by homeowners or their agents. So much as Wikipedia is a living database of all the world's knowledge, Zillow has become a living database of all the property parcel information in the US and that allows this estimate and other data on Zillow to become more accurate over time. And does it apply only to existing home sales or also new homes? We also come up with estimates with new homes based on the property records that either come to us from the county or come to us from the listings feeds from new construct from home builders who send us feeds. So, um, Also, when we get new information about a home, it, this estimate will change. So, for example, if county records have three bedrooms, three baths, 3,000 square feet, and then we become aware, either because the listing information says so or because a homeowner tells us that the property has four bedrooms and four baths and 4,000 square feet, we recalculate this estimate at that point. Susan, what is your view of the process that uh, uh, Spencer just described? Is, uh, how, how sound from a pricing standpoint is it? It's a great process. It's using <clears throat> what we call hedonic analysis, that is taking the attributes of the property and weighting them to efficiently use them statistically to come out with the best estimate. There are other ways of doing this. You could do repeat sales, and that avoids the structure of the home and the differences in the structure of the home. What's interesting about this is it incorporates not just the value changes in the neighborhood the, or the nearest neighbors, but also the attributes of your own home, and that's an advantage. Now, uh, a question for both of you is that I've heard some criticism, especially from realtors, uh, that it's uh, that that uh, the estimate or, or the pricing model that Zillow uses may have some flaws, uh, and because there are some factors that just can't be captured and automated. Uh, do you agree with that criticism? And if so, what do you? What's your response? I, I do agree with that. I mean, it's computer generated on every home in the country three times a week, so uh, it. We, Zillow, no employee of Zillow has ever been in your home. Uh, so um, for a computer-generated valuation, we believe it's quite accurate, and it's a good starting point. We call it a zestimate, not a appraisal. It's meant to be a starting point, and if you want to figure out a more accurate determination of your home's value, then we encourage you to talk to a real estate agent or an appraiser who will come to your home and refine the valuation. Absolutely. If you have something special like um, uh, a... Um, a, a pool for koi fish, let's say. <laughs> They'll never know. And you'll know it's very important to you and might be important to some buyer. Uh, so that's why it's a basic estimate. And there may be some negatives as well that may not be incorporated. That's right. So uh, if, you, if you take some of the other companies that are active in the same space as Zillow, uh, say Realtor.com or Trulia, uh, Everyone has access to the same basic data, which is from the multiple listing system or the MLS. Uh, what is your strategy to contain uh, to to create a sustainable advantage uh, for Zillow, so, uh, based on the fact that you all start with the same? Well, uh, you're, you're right that at the core, it's there's fundamentally commoditized listings information, which is why we don't focus exclusively on that. So if you think of um, the entire housing stock of the United States, 110 million homes, about 3% of them are for sale in the MLS at any point in time. Everybody has that information. Um, and that's on tens of thousands of other websites. So we try to innovate on top of that, for example, by having estimates, by showing historical estimates, by showing sale data going back 15 years, tax information, making predictions of what's going to happen to that home's value going forward. 
but fundamentally the, the price, the photos, the square footage, that's on every website. And so that's not enough. What we then do is we have information on hundreds of thousands of make me move listings when an owner posts a dream price for their home. New construction listings, for sale by owner listings. We're the only website with over a million foreclosure and pre-foreclosure listings um, posted for free for consumers. And then of course we have market context. We have information on every home in the country. And then we have ratings and reviews, 250,000 reviews of real estate agents that consumers have left on Zillow. So we do our best to innovate not on that commoditized information, but on all the other stuff, which we think is what differentiates us from competitors. So do you think this is enough to create a sustainable competitive advantage for Zillow, or can others catch up? Now the key is the algorithms, which one can improve over time, and which become self-improving with additional data. And uh, adding data, particularly individual input, that others don't have or can't organize, in some of this data, you can't just replicate the back and forth individual uh, re-estimates of the property, I think is a sustainable model. There's also, of course, the name Zillow. And uh, there, are, there isn't going to be room here, I don't think, for many firms with many names. People are going to gravitate to whoever has the most information, and then that firm will have the most information going forward. The, the platform shift from the desktop to mobile has also been a great boon to our business. because. Also. Um, we're a software company, and we can devote massive amounts of resources to create software, especially on mobile, where it's very complex to write software across multiple mobile platforms. So for example, we went public about a year and a half ago. When we went public, 20 homes were viewed every second on Zillow on mobile. A year and a half later, it's 75 homes viewed every second. A year and a half ago, we had five mobile apps. Today, we have 24. Just to give you a sense of just how quickly our, our usage is shifting to mobile, more homes are now viewed on Zillow on mobile than on the desktop. So uh, as more and more usage shifts towards mobile, it's difficult for individual brokerage websites at, at a local level to compete because it requires so much software to create great mobile, app, great mobile experiences and great mobile apps. Um, and it's difficult for even other national players to compete. So we, we definitely benefit from that. Um, I, I just saw some interesting data from Domino's Pizza, believe it or not. Um, at their investor day, they put up a slide that showed national uh, market share of Domino's and Pizza Hut over the last 10 years versus local pizza places. And it was basically flat between national and local for the last 10 plus years. And then about two years ago, something interesting happened. The national guys gained a couple points of share really out of nowhere versus the local pizza, um, pizza stores. And the reason is the smartphone. Because all of a sudden people now are ordering pizzas from Domino's and Pizza Hut's mobile apps, but the local pizza guy can't really compete with that. And, I, you know, a big shareholder of ours showed that to me and said, you know, I bet you never thought you'd have something in common with Domino's Pizza, <laughs> but the way you're dominating on mobile is very similar, and you're seeing this in other verticals as well. That's really fascinating. Um, one more question about how do you ensure the accuracy of your data? Uh, I was talking to some real estate developers, and they said that for some markets, your data is absolutely spot on accurate. In other markets, maybe not so much. Do you think that the quality of your data is sort of uneven? And if so, what are you doing to address that um, issue? Well, this is an industry-wide problem, which as the largest player in the industry, we, um, we definitely have. And it's something that we focus on and that we apply a lot of resources to. Um, the data on Zillow comes partly from county records. And there it can be corrected by owners or agents. But it also comes to us by agents. And so for example, when a listing agent posts a home for sale, and if the home sells, he doesn't take it down, well, we have a stale listing. So we've deployed a lot of software, a lot of business expertise, and a lot of money towards improving this problem. And we've come a long way. But it's an industry-wide problem, which unfortunately, I think, will, will continue to be something that we, that we work on for, for years. It is a problem. It's a problem in part because our sales records are, are, are county level. Uh, it's actually in some ways stunning that we as a country do not collect the data and don't verify the data. Uh, and some states have really poor, and some cities have really poor collection methodologies. Uh, this is a concern on a wider scale. Uh, for example, Fannie Freddie, uh, which are national players and are now taxpayer owned, uh, they have a price index which uh, arguably is far behind the Zillow price index. So. This tells us we should be putting more public resources, I think, in this direction as well. Uh, you're also doing some interesting work in the area of uh, rental housing. Could you tell us a little bit about what are some of the challenges involved in that? Sure. So rentals is a very big area of investment for us. We bought three companies in the last 18 months uh, there for over $60 million. We have about 100 people out of 600 people at the company focused exclusively on the rentals opportunity. And the reason that we're so excited about it is it's a $5 billion market. 
property managers and landlords spend $5 billion advertising their listings to consumers. And the structure of the industry is quite different than the structure of the for sale industry. Notably, it's, it's disorganized. There are no, in most markets outside of Manhattan, for example, it, they're not broker controlled markets. So property managers and real estate developers market their listings directly on sort of a many to many approach rather than going through a centralized MLS or centralized brokerage system. And that allows us, we hope, the opportunity to create the marketplace, to basically superset Craigslist. So to give you some numbers, there are 4 million rental units available for rent in the US at any point in time. Craigslist has about 750,000 of them. We have about 600,000, and a year ago we had 300,000. Most other sites have about 100,000. So the strategy is to give away software, give away property management software to the industry for free, and one of the acquisitions that I mentioned is a company that, that built that type of software, give it away for free in order to out Craigslist Craigslist, to end up with many more listings than Craigslist, and then hopefully we'll become the marketplace, and then we can monetize it. So today we don't monetize rentals at all, or hardly at all, um, and we're delaying that gratification until we are the marketplace, and then we can focus on monetizing it. What do you think of uh, Zillow's strategy, Susan? I think the rental market is growing in the U.S., so it's important to have that coverage. It's less organized, as we said, so that's a, a real strategic move. But even more so going forward, there's a lot of information in the comparisons of rents to values. And to be able to get that accurately, that too will be a game changer. So let me ask, end with one last question. So in so many ways, Zillow has been highly successful. And to take just one metric, uh, since your IPO in 2011, your stock, stock price has gone up to $55, and I just saw a report from Goldman Sachs setting a $60 target for it. Uh, so, but regardless of what happens to the stock, what is your definition of success for Zillow? Um, my definition of success is about creating a ever, an everlasting and enduring brand that my children, or maybe someday grandchildren, will know. Um, there are very few technology companies that have created brands that endure for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, you know, Microsoft is really one of the only ones, and I suppose Apple, that has endured for a long, long period of time. And to me, it feels like we're just getting started. We have less than 1% revenue share across the $35 billion in advertising in our space. Um, and we have a relatively little known brand relative to the size of the opportunity. Only about 12% of Americans, believe it or not, have heard of Zillow, uh, if you ask Americans. And yet we're the leading real estate website. If you look at other categories, you know, name a finance website, 90% of people will say E-Trade or CNBC.com. Name a travel website, 90% of people will say Expedia. Name a healthcare website, 90% of people will say WebMD. Name a real estate website, 12% will say Zillow. That to me, you, know, you might think as the CEO of, of, of Zillow that would be depressing. But actually, I get very excited about that opportunity. You know, think of all the potential. Um, and to me, that's success, is closing that gap. And if we do that, then a lot of other great things will follow, revenue, profit, market cap, et cetera. Great. Susan, you get the last word. <laughs> well, market information in real estate is almost uh, uh, contradictory in, in its very sense. But in fact, this, is, this contradiction is being undone. And um, we're, we're bringing transparency, and Zillow is one of the ways it's happening. So I congratulate the firm. Good luck, and thank you to both of you. Really uh, glad you joined Knowledge at Wharton today. Thank you.